everybody, welcome to Saving Video Game History. We are the co-directors of the Video Game History Foundation. Uh, my name is Kelsey Lewin. And uh, I'm Frank Cifaldi. Uh, I have been preserving video game history in one form or another for about 20 years now. Um, kind of started way back in the early 2000s with a website called Lost Levels, which was the, the first website to focus on sort of finding and preserving games that never came out. Um, that actually evolved weirdly into a video game journalism career that I, I did for quite a while. Um, I did a little bit of uh, game development and publishing as well. Uh, some people know my work at Digital Eclipse. I uh, directed a, a project called Mega Man Legacy Collection uh, and another one called SNK 40th. Worked on uh, the other products there as well, Street Fighter 30th, uh, Disney Afternoon Collection. Um, but really all this time, I've. I like to say that I've, I've stayed in the video game industry almost as an excuse uh, because my real work has always been the preservation part of it. Um, so I founded the Video Game History Foundation about four years ago because uh, I felt that there was a need for more institutionalized um, video game preservation. There's you know a lot of work being done out in the world, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but I felt like... Uh, what we were missing outside of the sort of public display museums um, was something, I don't know, along the lines of maybe the Film Foundation, which, you know, uh, I'm not going to lie, like that's partially where the name came from. Um, and so, yeah, I started this four years ago trying to uh, sort of organize not only uh, preservation efforts, but the industry at large. Um, launched three and a half-ish years ago, early 2017, um, with a, uh, a Patreon big publish splat, pub, public splash, uh, which is actually how I met uh, Kelsey. Yeah, so I, won't, I don't have quite as long of a story that goes into this, but uh, my day job is I own a couple of video game stores in the Seattle area, Pink Gorilla Games. If you attend normal PAX West, uh, you've probably seen us over by the men's bathrooms on the fourth floor. The other thing I am is a historian and a researcher, and I came to the Video Game History Foundation kind of as a frustrated researcher. Um, it was really difficult to find the kind of sources and types of materials that would have helped me out in my research and I was like why isn't anyone doing about anything about this and it turns out there was there was one guy doing something about it so uh <laughs> <laughs> there's more than one guy but I think That's, yeah <laughs> I, th I think it's more that our values aligned right yes. like we're both we're both uh easily frustrated <laughs> historian types who are um extreme perfectionists uh who uh are really upset that there isn't just this, uh, there, there isn't much in the way of resources to uh, deep dive, I think would be the, the, the fair way to yeah. sort of say what our connection here was, right? Um, so uh, I, I wanna talk a little briefly, actually, before we get into the, the slideshow, just about what it is that we're talking about here today, which is, um, th this is sort of a tutorial, I guess, or a overview of video game preservation as we see it right now. Uh, what's going on in the world, how, but I, I think more importantly, like how the foundation itself uh, views the state of preservation and, and sort of like what our values are, what we think people should be focusing on that maybe they're not thinking about. That, yeah, that how, how we define video game history preservation and, um, and how it looks a little bit different than I think the sort of uh, the normal thing you think about when you think about game preservation. Yeah, I think that's that's fair. Yep. So uh, I won't spend too long on this slide. Why I say video game history? If you're listening to this talk, I mean you probably already care. We don't need to tell you <laughs> that video games are really important. Uh, but should, should we mention all the billions that they make? Is that what people <laughs> want to hear? Yeah. yeah. Do we have to talk about the fact that video games are out earning both the film industry and the music industry? Should we say that? Uh, Do you guys like video games? Or why are you here? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but mostly, you know, we just don't want our stories to be forgotten. Um, and so many of them probably already have been, or so many of them haven't been told yet. We want historians to be able to uncover these stories and tell them. So when people think of game preservation, I think the first thing they think of is like, let's just get all the games. If we have yeah. all of the games, if we have saved them all from the garbage and we have a big shelf of them or a big museum of them, we've preserved video games. We've done it. Uh, now historians can do their job and that's the game right there. Yeah. 
but not, I mean, that's not really how we think of it. Um, museums obviously are fantastic. They do a lot of great work, but there's only And so in fact, many... that was a museum on the prior yes, slide, right? that was right? the that was... uh, National Video Game Museum in Frisco, Texas, yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's only a, a finite amount of things that someone can get from the game itself. Uh, right here on, on this slide, I have a photo of uh, Chris Kohler's I guess old series now, because he's no longer with Kotaku, <laughs> but uh, called Complete in Box, where he uh, would examine the entire retail game and you get to learn everything you can learn from that box. Uh, yeah, and, and, I, and I like this example because it's like, you know, this is, you know, if you if you give someone who's awesome, like Chris Kohler, right, the, the game, right, here's the physical game, uh, tell its story, uh, I think... Chris in this series demonstrates the upper limit of one can do in terms of telling a game story with just the game. Yeah, he squeezed every ounce you can get out of this. You can get how it's played, uh, what it sounded like. If you're good at it, you can get you know most of that stuff. If you're not so good at it, you're still gonna yeah. Miss there might some be things in the there might be credits or something, right? You can <laughs> you can um, you can look at the packaging design and maybe extrapolate trends from the time, right? But it's you don't really get much more than than what's handed to you there. Yeah, what so, they wanted to sell you, you know? Right. So is that enough? I mean, it's enough for there to be a great video series with that exact premise, but I don't think that's enough to, uh, you know, build all kinds of documentaries and stuff on, right? So right, we... and it's like, well, it's I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's like. Uh, you know, it, it, it's sort of the first thing everyone thinks of is like collect the video games, right? And um, it's, uh, you know, it's like we're saying, there's there's only so much you can get from it. But, uh, you know, if, if you want to go to the next slide here, I, I think this surprises a lot of people uh, because there are museums, uh, because there are video game collectors, and because we think that there's only so much you get from a retail game, uh, we just, we don't bother collecting video games at the Video Game History Foundation. Yeah, and I mean, I say mostly on this slide just because there are a couple yeah. exceptions. We do own some games. Um, I've, you know, personally willed my whole collection to the foundation, whatever. You know, there's there's exceptions here, but um, we don't feel like it's necessary for a Video Game History Foundation to have the games because historians know how to use emulators. Um, Video game collecting is a really popular hobby, so there's plenty of people who have, you know, documented the retail, the boxes, the manuals, there's a bunch of people doing great work even scanning all of that stuff. Um, and then other libraries and museums are already collecting the games. This photo here is from the Strong Museum of Play. They have an enormous collection of retail video games in their archives, um, so there are places doing a very good job at that already. Yeah, that's uh, John Paul Dyson and Shannon Simmons uh, pretending to examine some Mega Drive games. <laughs> no, uh, they do really have actually, it. they're really examining, uh, really I don't know. Them. Are they really like talking about know. whatever that is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they actually, I mean, they have, you know, they don't have everything, everything, but they, for example, they have a, they're looking at a complete Mega Drive collection, which is awesome. As in Japanese Mega Drive. They, yeah. they have the the entirety of the Japanese Sega Genesis catalog. Um and, you know, it's we're not saying that we don't think that there's any importance to it. It's just that there are other ways to get it. Like, like we between us, I, I think we could source any video game right now if we really had to. Yeah, I also but there's, own two well, game stores. So, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But there's plenty in the world that we can't get at easily. Exactly. So we've decided basically that you need more than just the games to research. You need to understand not just what the games were themselves, but you need to understand how they were made and how they were played um, for good research. So when we talk about how games were made, um, we're talking about everything on the development side. So this is things like the source code, which I don't know, you, you've done a really good job at explaining what source code is in the past. Oh, right? sure. I mean, like, source code is the actual building blocks of the game. Um, if you're looking at a retail game, you might be able to, like, if you guys are familiar with cutting room floor wiki, stuff like that, people are able to do some level of data mining and hacking to understand what's going on under the hood. Uh, but the actual source code is, I wish I had a good analogy for it, but it's, it's 
you know, it's direct access to the the inner workings of the game. It's like going inside the matrix. Um, so we actually all put kinds of stuff that's you know not able to be accessed in any way from the final game. It's been scrubbed right. out in one way or another. Oh yeah, yeah. Like if 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 anyone listening, you know, is a coder at all, it's you know you you can comment out code and it doesn't get built into the game. So there's plenty of stuff if you look in source code that might be like early ideas or beta versions of things that uh, don't make it into that final ROM because they're commented out of the source or they're not built in. Um, but it's not just code uh, when we talk about source code. It's it's like if you're looking to the right uh, of this image right now, uh, these are uh, pictures of the a couple of the development tools used on um, Disney's Aladdin on the Sega Mega Drive, which is uh, in our collection, source code-wise. Uh, so you get to see what the animation tools were and how they were used. And and uh, below that is actually Cakewalk, which is a, a common music sequencer. But you know, this is Cakewalk running the actual Aladdin Cakewalk files, and you could see how Tommy Tallarico actually composed the music uh, digitally for the game. Um, so when we talk about source, like I said, it's not just that digital source. It's also uh, things like original art, uh, documentation, like we said. There's there's things like design documents or pitch documents or things like that. Or like we sometimes see like internal correspondence uh, uh, between developers and publishers, things like that. We um, don't have many photos of the physical stuff here, but there's a lot of like paper stuff that mm -hmm. comes out of especially older games you know there were things that were sketched on real paper or there was a printed out design document or something that was passed around i mean there's there's all kinds of uh types of materials that can spin out of this yeah and i think what most people think of when they think of development stuff is it's like what we what collectors tend to call prototypes right like in the in the photo below um and these are pre-production versions of the game that are often, you know, not quite done yet. Uh, sometimes unreleased games entirely uh, end up on on media like this. Maybe they were sent out for review in a magazine or something like that, never shipped. Um, and these are really cool too, but uh, I think, you know, personally, I'm a little more interested in going more under the hood and, 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 uh, and really seeing how what makes the games tick. I agree. Um, but we have some problems with getting all of this stuff. Some problems, some reasons you can't find this stuff right now, and you can't really be looking at it right now. Uh, the big one is that it's all a trade secret, and even for stuff really, really old, uh, no one really wants you to see it. Like a, a company, like I'm trying to think of a good example, but you know, there's any company who's been making games since the 70s or 80s, even that stuff that they might not ever touch again, they still don't really want you looking under the hood at. Uh, yeah, most often. Um, and also, when you're talking about games that are that old, they probably threw it all away because the secondary market for video games, the sort of like HD remaster world we live in right now, or even just re-release on the eShop or whatever, this is a new thing. This isn't something that existed back in the 80s. There wasn't going to be another, you know, they weren't going to put Double Dragon on the next thing. They were just going to move on. It's, you know, that was the NES one and we're going to make another one for the Super Nintendo or whatever. Um, and of course, I'm laughing. I'm laughing because it did make it forward to the Genesis. That was not, not the best example, but oh, for the NES Double Dragon. <laughs> yeah, just regular double. Well, the arcade game got ported to got NES it. and then Genesis. But yes. but you're, but yes, to your point. Well, yeah, to <laughs> to your point, it's like if you're you know, video game coding back then, it wasn't like Unity or whatever, right? Where there's sort of a common engine that ran things. Like you were, you were. Uh, you were developing in machine language for that specific machine. Uh, so the idea of utilizing that source for the next machine was uh, in most cases laughable. You just wouldn't do it. You might reference it or something. Um, but I think more importantly, it, it's just, there wasn't really a market yet, even theoretically for older games being re-released. And it's, you know, we're, we're often comparing things to film industry, the, the film preservation history around here and it's, it's so similar um to the earliest days of american cinema where uh, i forget the stat and <laughs> I, I say this so often i should just know the stat but it's something like 80 percent of american cinema made before 1930 just doesn't exist anymore and it's not because you know people were stupid or whatever it's just that they hadn't yet conceived of a reason to keep it because once they didn't have DVDs they, back then. 
Yeah, there were no DVDs. <laughs> there wasn't even VHS. There wasn't even televisions yeah. in homes yet, right? There wasn't even the idea of broadcasting a, a film once it was done. Once it was done, the studio would make prints. They'd sell it to theaters, and that'd be done, right? Like, like audiences weren't uh, yet nostalgic, right, for wanting a film to come back and be re-released. Like, it was just they only were into the new thing, and then it got tossed. And um, luckily video games have almost always been a home medium or even when they weren't, they were, you know, physically in an arcade and that board itself had the product on it. So most of uh, the actual playable games themselves are fine, but the, the original source that really kind of gives you that insight into how it was made and the decisions that were made and, and the kinds of things really that we think historians would need to like write us a book about a game's making of, uh, you know, that stuff just got tossed because there was no reason to keep it for a really long time. Right. And it is getting a lot better these days, oh, but yeah. modern developers still do lose their source code pretty often. I mean, even when they're trying to keep it, sometimes just offices closed, there are server migrations. I mean, things don't make the move all the time. I'm me and I've lost stuff. Yeah, I was so. going to say, I see you smiling <laughs> over there. What have, what have you lost? <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, so that's no one cares think. about my work, right? <laughs> that, that's almost any developer. It's like who cares? No one's gonna need to like, see yeah, this. Game, I'm like, I'm, I'm guilty of it too. Games are historically important, just not my games. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> who, no one needs to see Sharknado, the video game, on the iPhone. We absolutely need was... to see Sharknado, the video game. <laughs> Wait, we were there's like a two month contract thing, and no one played it. Who cares? <laughs> Um, so that's how the game. I, I do have the source code for Sharknado the video game. If anyone needs it, hit me up. <laughs> Anyways, uh, <laughs> that's how the games were made, and you know what we care about in regards to how the games were made. Um, but also, really important, and I think often forgotten, is how the games were played. How does the world mm -hmm. interact with a game? What were the discussions going on around a game at the time? What was the criticism of the game? What were the fan communities like? Um, there's speculation and rumors that, you know, have historically been huge stories that we just, you know, once once they're settled, we just kind of forget about that whole saga that we all went through, right? Um, mm -hmm. There's marketing, there's PR, um, and we have, you know, I have all these images on here, like, Pokemon was on the cover of Time Magazine. If you handed someone a copy of Pokemon Red right now, and they had just never heard of Pokemon, they're not getting the fact that Pokemon was on the cover of Time Magazine. That's how big it was, you know? Yeah. Um, or these huge Minecraft conventions or, you know, this This is another Pokemon example, but uh, Pokemon at the Nintendo store in New York um, or all these people crowding around a Pac-Man machine. I mean, this is a huge part of the story is when you have kind of a, a mania around something or a bunch of, uh, you know, rumors around something or discussion in any form. So... Is it possible to capture all of this? I mean, we have some photos here, um, but we think the best way to capture this stuff is the video game media. These yeah, are... at least within our constraints, right? Yes. Like, like the the best thing we can focus on that is like <laughs> the best bang for our buck in terms of our resources capturing history. I, yeah, we we kind of the conclusion is the video game media. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, the best thing would be that someone's going around with a video right. camera all the time and capturing yes, every we... website, every forum post, every yeah. tweet. I mean, there's yeah. If we had a crew <laughs> of fifty and their jobs were to go capture everything, great. But we, you are looking at the full time crew of the yeah. video game history foundation so <laughs> so we think of the video game media as really really useful as sort of a time capsule because what you get especially and when i say media i mean in these photos i'm talking about magazines and stuff this could also be um you know newsletters um we'd love for it to also be websites but thankfully the internet archive is covering a lot of that um but when you look at a magazine you get a lot of let's say you're researching something like Pokemon or whatever, if you're looking at a magazine that includes Pokemon coverage, you're also getting all kinds of other stuff with it, um, all kinds of other contextual stuff. You're getting uh, what else was coming out around that time, what were people talking about, what was exciting people. Um, it, the games media covers, you know, you'll see how a game was marketed and advertised. We all like to laugh at those old 90s ads that are really 
terrible and <laughs> and strange. But you know, that's that's the kind of world that a historian needs to be able to peer into if they're telling the mm -hmm. entire story. Um, what was the industry news people were talking about? You know, what were the big takeaways from E3 that year? That's a, that can be a really huge one. Or if you're going even earlier, like CES or something. Um, what rumors were making the rounds, you get coverage of trade shows and events, like I just said, and it, just overall, you get a lot of context. You get a lot of what else was going on in the world and how were people receiving this. Yeah, so this photo is, you know, a very small slice of our actual library, which I'm sitting in right now. Um, we have attempted to collect basically all of the video game magazines. Um, so we're most of the way there. I'd say we're like... For the U.S. Nine, for the U.S., we're most of the way there, yes. Yeah. For, I'd say we've got maybe 95% of magazines up through like 2004 or something like that. It gets a little hairy after that. Um, but also that's not so bad because the internet exists at that point, you know, you know, we, we go a little bit beyond that too. Obviously we go beyond the U S we've got a lot of UK magazines. We focus mostly on English language, but get the rest where we can. Uh, we have a lot of books, but I think even more interesting than that is we, we sort of try to hit the periphery of the video game media. So things like, uh, show dailies from E3 and CES, or even indeed, like we have some CES and E3 like guidebooks going back to the early 80s. So you can see who was actually exhibiting at the show. Um, we have things like uh, um, from the early, from the late 70s, early 80s, like home video magazines actually talked about video games as well, because they were sort of considered part of that world. Um, trade magazines for things like consumer electronics uh, and maybe toys. Like we try to capture, you know, anyone who was really talking about games in the media, we try to capture all of that. And the goal is that if you're studying a game, uh, we can give you as wide a berth as possible uh, for seeing what people were saying about the game in its time using whatever media survived. Right. So knowing how games are made and played is kind of how we get like the big picture of a game. I mean, it, these are pretty broad categories that cover just about, you know, broad on purpose. This is what we focus on because we want people to be able to tell the complete story. And right now, people are really bad video game historians. <laughs> Let's look at no some offense. examples. No offense, maybe a little, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, this is my favorite one, this Jeopardy one up here. Uh, yeah. This was a real episode of Jeopardy where they they said that the Tetris blocks have names like Orange Ricky, Hero, and Smash Boy. Um, yeah, and that was based on a like Photoshop someone did and tweeted as a joke, yes. but it just made it into Jeopardy. And it made yeah. it into actual Jeopardy. Um, yeah. Ready Player One uh, talks about how the very first video game Easter egg um, is Adventure and... I mean, that is it, not that there are dozens before that. Yeah, yeah, and there was a time where this was mm -hmm. the earliest one that people could find, but it had already been debunked by the time he was writing this book. So right, but it's like it's it's persisted so much that it's it's like a major scene in the Steven Spielberg directed yeah, film. Right, you know. Um, this is my favorite one because uh, I'm a big Gunpei Koi fan. So uh, <laughs> there was, a, and did you know gaming actually, honestly, these days does pretty good work. But um, back in the earlier days, uh, they called him a janitor. Well, he was a, a college educated engineer and he was actually hired at Nintendo. This is the inventor of the Game Boy, by the way, and uh, several other things, Game and Watch. Um, but he was hired as a janitor at Nintendo <laughs> and he, and he, he rose magic. through the ranks. Yeah. 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 It's a great Cinderella story, but it's not true. Uh, he was a college educated engineer and he was very good at it. And he was hired to like be the engineer on all of their factory machinery. So, I mean, was Oh, he... I didn't know that. I thought he was just a product engineer. That's interesting. Yeah. He's a like would cool. fix the machines on the floor and stuff. Yeah. Oh, uh, I like him too now. Yeah. He's great. Um, there's been several, several, several people who have talked about how E.T. was, A, the worst video game in the world and, you know, tanked the video game industry and caused the, the, the great crash and all of that stuff. Um, in reality... And, and again, major movie around this myth, yes. right? Like, there, there's a Netflix documentary that, that even though they attempted to, like, put a little bit more of color on it and, and explain that it wasn't 
quite the story that E three tank that uh, sorry E T <laughs> tank Atari. Um, that's that's still story. like the story. Yeah. <laughs> yes, um, E three tank Atari. <laughs> Um, but in reality, E.T. wasn't even the worst game to yeah. come out that yeah. month. Or get the worst game of all time. Like, it wasn't even... Yeah, if you if you go back and get the source material like we're talking about... Yeah, exactly. Like, this is the same issue of electronic fun uh, with computers and games that reviewed E.T. Like, Gorf reviewed lower than that. Yeah. The, you know, the magazines, like, the reviews... And there's actually an article on our website, uh, GameHistory.org, that, that actually does pull up all the reviews for E3... E I did it again. For <laughs> E.T. to demonstrate this. And it's, like, their the reviews, as, as we say here, you know, they're, they're eh, right? They're just, like, eh, it's, yeah, it's okay. Like it's not it, exciting. But... Yeah. Yeah, we're, we don't like the game, but it's not... It's fine. Yeah. But... But the, yeah, the point is you would never know any of this based on what has become popularly accepted because, I mean, you know, you have to be able to look at all of this stuff. Um, this is an example I know you like a lot. Why did Earth Yeah, fail? yeah, yeah. This is one that I helped out with. Uh, there was a documentary being shot about Earthbound. I don't think it ever got released, but um, they actually came and, and uh, interviewed me as, as an historian um, about Earthbound because, well, I'm a fan, but also... Uh, you know, I, I know a little bit about its history that, that people might not. And um, uh, what fans might know is that the game kind of failed, at least in the U.S. It just did not perform to expectation, didn't sell very well. Uh, it might amuse people to know that there were stacks of new inbox Earthbound being blown out for like five bucks at Toys R Us at one point. Um, but and 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 I think the consensus from fans was like, oh, it's the marketing, right? Like, the marketing must have been really bad. And the marketing was a little strange. Uh, the tagline from Nintendo was, this game stinks. But I think they were going for that sort of, like, gross-out Nickelodeon kind of feel. Yeah. I don't know. And um, uh, this, <laughs> I do want to mention real quick, this uh, press release that we have from Nintendo here is pretty funny. It's not, it's not good. They use a really great phrase here, which is uh, featuring humorous and obscure dialogue. Obscure dialogue. I don't know what obscure dialogue means. But... So that's like, <laughs> oh, what does that mean? Is it like, know. does that does that mean you're like referencing really obscure things? You know mm. what I mean? Like, is it like if if I'm if I'm uh, like repeating dialogue from like a really random episode of Elf from yeah, season three or something? Is, is that obscure from, dialogue? Like, every line is taken from like a B movie you've never heard of. <laughs> <laughs> or like a, a a poet that that kind of got forgotten in the fifties or something like really obscure dialogue, um, yeah, like a play that never took off. Yeah, um, but yeah. So you know the 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 question was like why did Earthbound fail was kind of posed in this documentary and uh, what I was able to do for them was from our library we pulled out every review of the game like like we just laid them all out you know literally on a table we just opened all of them up and laid them all out and read them all. And um, first of all, by reading all the reviews, you start seeing trends. Like uh, every reviewer, almost every reviewer, uh, did not like the graphics in Earthbound, that, which sounds weird now. Because again, you just hand someone a game now, like Earthbound, and they're going to go, oh, these pixel graphics are cool. Um, back then, uh, in 1995, early 1995, the reviewers of this game almost unanimously said the graphics were bad. Uh, they used words like childish. They were used words like 8-bit. Um, so that gives you a little bit of a sense of like what a like gamer in 1995 would think of Earthbound if you handed it to him. But uh, more than that, you start looking at the, the context. Or, and, and as a result, you know, it didn't review terribly well. It wasn't awful. Uh, uh, but, you know, it wasn't a hot game at the time. Um, it wasn't even... A hot RPG, right? Like Chrono Trigger had just come out to universal acclaim, and then Earthbound was like, eh. Um, but more than that, you start looking at the context. Like you're, you've got these magazines, uh, you got the review of Earthbound. You start flipping around the magazines for more context, right? Um, these same reviewers who are playing Earthbound, like they already have a PlayStation and a Saturn, so everyone, you know, is looking forward to this new 3D future. And again like hindsight's 2020 or whatever, like I look back at 1995 PlayStation graphics, I don't think they look that great. Uh, but back then it's like, that's the future. There's 3D. They're, they're seeing, you know, previews of Final Fantasy VII, maybe even at that point. Um, so, you know, of course they think the graphics are bad. And it's like, even Nintendo it, at this point is kind of done with 2D. 
Um, they're showing at Winter CES that year, like the trade show where they debuted Earthbound. Uh, the three games they were spotlighting were Star Fox 2, Comanche, and FX Fighter, which were all 3D games on the Super Nintendo using the, the Super FX. Yeah, none of them <laughs> shipped, which is hilarious. Like, the, like, the, like the, all three spotlight games that show, like, none of them shipped. And then off in the corner is Earthbound, which is, like, this nostalgic throwback RPG. Like, it's it, it, like no one in America is ready for that in 1995. So, um, I just I, I don't think it's even possible to have successfully marketed Earthbound in 1995, and I know that now because we have that context and can look through it. So that's a really good example of, you know, the power of just just from magazines of the kinds of stories you could extrapolate that you just wouldn't see otherwise. So, people are bad video game historians, but it's not their fault. <laughs> and this is something that I think we both came around to, uh, rather than like being upset at all of these things that are wrong, we're leaning into it. It's not their fault. And I'll tell yeah. you why, because here's where you can currently find this stuff. The internet? Yeah. If people have already researched it, maybe scan some stuff and put it on there. Maybe they put something on the internet archive. Yeah, uh, an internet archive, we should say like, even we, you know, as people with access to this stuff, first stops the internet archive yeah. almost every time. Yes. Um, because, you know, a lot of these magazines are scanned, a lot of old books and weird, you know, newspapers and stuff like that are scanned, and you could text search the archive. And again, on GameHistory.org, we actually have a tutorial uh, for text searching the internet archive. Um, but yeah, like, that's kind of the best thing, is like, we can find some raw material on the internet archive, or we can just hope that people have done real research before, and you know, we can go to Wikipedia and hope that they actually have citations that we can follow. Yeah, and if, I mean, there's some paid services too, newspapers.com, you can maybe get some yeah. newspaper coverage, AlexisNexis or whatever. I mean, there's some, yeah, there's there's some, some. If you happen to be a university student, yeah, you might have uh, yes, access exactly. to some of the stuff, yeah. Yeah. Um, go to the library. There's, yeah, sure. Yeah, there's... Actually, this was written pre-COVID, so we're not saying good one, like, haha, yeah, right, you can just go to oh, a library. yeah, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> there's actually what we're not saying anything is that, in, in libraries. <laughs> yes, there's not video game stuff in libraries generally, certainly not the magazines, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, some magazines have probably been scanned. There's retro mags and the Internet Archive again. And again, we're not saying that, like, this work hasn't, been done it's just it's not nearly complete there's there's a lot of gaps if you're only relying on the internet right um so here is us looking for that same uh et thing that we were just showing off that review from electronic fun with computers and games if you wanted to find a copy of that at any library in the world uh <laughs> this is <laughs> this these is are my, both of them <laughs> yeah these are both of them that have any copies of Electronic Fun with Computers and Games, as you can see, um, this is a Seattle zip code here. Um, it is 1,800 miles to the Michigan State University Library. and it is That's your closer one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then it is 2,100 miles to the Strong Museum of Play. And if you were to make that 1,800-mile trip, you would find uh, that there actually are only two random issues from 82 and 84 of this publication, neither of which are the one that actually reviewed E.T. So point is that libraries don't have video game magazines. Now, in this case, specifically, uh, the full run of Electronic Fun with computer and games happens to all be scanned. So this is not an inaccessible magazine if you know where to look. Um, hopefully they're all in the Internet Archive. I haven't checked in a while, but there's other places they, they do tend to pop up. But again, we can't just rely on what's scanned. Um, for example, Tips and Tricks here, which was a really mega popular magazine. Um, they really liked yeah, Mortal Kombat too. They loved Mortal Kombat. Wow. <laughs> all three of those. Look yeah. at that. I, I didn't even <laughs> notice that when I made this. <laughs> um, wow, really competing with EGM or whatever at the time, I guess. Um, yeah, it's just there's a lot of holes because... Frankly, a lot of these magazines are really rare. Like, I, God, I really hate trying to collect tips and tricks because this is the kind of magazine that, you know, kids got and, like, dog-eared and, like, you know, like, got the tips they needed and, like, threw away. It wasn't, like, something you put on a bookshelf. So a lot of this stuff is kind of hard to find now. Um, but anyway, uh, this next slide is really good. I want so, you to leave this one. Yeah, so basically 
I mean, this is uh, the Barnes and Noble near my house, and I took these photos. Um, now it's been a little while, but I promise I've been back and it looks exactly the same. As you can see on the left here, um, this is the gaming area. It is five shelves. It's one of their like smaller, more squat shelves. And if you zoom in on the top two shelves, it's actually not video games at all. It's uh, like RPG and tabletop gaming, and I actually think that spills over into the uh, into the shelf next to it. So I think the tabletop has more representation than the video games. But also, if you look at the video games, you might notice that, oh my god, those are all art books and guidebooks. Yeah. Like, every single one of those there. I think there might be, like, a copy of Blood, Sweat, and Pixels or something. You know, one of the three video game books that Barnes & Noble <laughs> occasionally has. Yeah, they um, might have Console Wars or something, yeah, right? Yeah, but exactly. It's, but it's, like, there's not really a lot of video game books on shelves. But if you look at this other thing right here, this is their music section. This is their <laughs> section for books on music. And almost every single one of these is historical in some way. They are biographies. Right. They are, you know, they're all kinds of, they're not like art books like we right. have on the gaming section. They're yeah, there's probably books. some of those, right? There's probably some that are like, here's some cool record album sure, covers, yeah, right? But Album cover but, compilation. Yeah, but a lot of these are like, here's the history of blues in the 30s. Here's right. an autobiography of a uh, guy from Rolling Stones or whatever, right? Like, there's, like, I mean, God, the word autobiography even, right? Like, what autobiographies are there in video games? There's, like, Ralph Bears. That's it. That's all, <laughs> that's all I can think there's of. There's that right one, now. Lucky That Way. Oh, uh, yeah, Lucky That Way. <laughs> um which is like, yeah, a, a fairly obscure game producer wrote a, a, an autobiography that's more of a self-help book. Um, <laughs> there's, I mean, there's got to be at least a couple more, but not really. Like, yeah. it's, it's like, it's really rare that there are published works about video games, even critical works. I mean, there's Boss Fight Books, like, I don't think is stocked at at, uh, at uh, Barnes & Noble, but... Um, you know, they, they're, they're, that, that at least exists, right? But right. it's still just like... And, and there's a couple of publishers out of the UK doing some pretty cool things. We're not saying they don't exist, but it's like, it's weird. Like, this picture to me right here is weird. Yeah, this when, amount when you... of difference between these two sections, I mean, it sh just shouldn't be anywhere near this bad. This is there's not, there's not a huge, you know, expo of, like, general music fans, right? Like, video games are very <laughs> inherently, like like fan and consumer driven, right? Like like fans want to learn more, they they want to explore more, they spend more time with the works. Um and we think that video games should look like this music section, yeah. but they don't. And it's just it's when you actually like step outside and think about it and this is such a good visual for it, like this doesn't make any sense. And Music's been around longer, sure, but also, again, I mean, I hate to use this example exclusively because I don't think that, you know, the amount of money something makes is di a direct analog right. to its cultural importance, but, um, I mean, music out, or sorry, video games out earn music by a lot. Uh, yeah, no it's, one makes money in music right yeah. now. <laughs> so it just it shouldn't be this bad this is crazy because yeah. people are still writing i mean i'm sure there's like a hundred books on music published every single day it's probably yeah. ridiculous um so <laughs> this was the the eternal question i wanted to answer is like why do video game sections of the bookstore look like this and it's because this stuff sucks to research it's because of all of the things that we said before if you want to write a book on a video game you're gonna get stuck yeah and it's you know the almost all of these books in the music section like this is how historians work right they had access to material they had access to people even maybe right and um there's probably a lot of university archives that are cited in this stuff there's probably you know things accessed in museums possibly um yeah you know, it's for people who are regular PAX attendees and know the uh mopop here in seattle yeah. Like we have yeah. a whole museum. It used to be called the Experience Music Project and it's just full of these like original sources for, you know, you've got all of Kurt Cobain's like original scripts and, and Yeah, I was lyrics. I was about to say that like there's at least two Nirvana books on the shelf that probably accessed some of like the raw Nirvana stuff from from uh from Mopop. Absolutely. Exactly. So, we want to make this easier. Um 
both selfishly and because it's the right thing. Because <laughs> I want to yeah, do we, better. We want to see better. Yeah. We want better YouTubers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to see better research. I want to do better research. I want, I want that bookshelf to not look like that. Um, yeah. We can tell much better stories, much more interesting stories, and inspire people to tell stories in the first place if we have access to this stuff. And, you know, not only do we want that bookstore to look better, um, there have been a handful of documentaries recently, but a lot of them, unfortunately, kind of grab at the same sort of, like, beeps yeah. and boops and 80s nostalgia and... <laughs> I mean, as we're, as we're recording this, we haven't watched it yet, but there's this brand new documentary series on Netflix uh, called High Score, right? And it's just like, you look at the trailer and it's just like pixely Pac-Man and spaceships zipping around and, you know, beep boop, hey, did you know that video games aren't just for kids anymore yeah, stuff? And, and, it's like, and, and, and again, I haven't watched it yet. It's probably, it might be great. It's but probably like, fine. That's, but video that's games still... deserve better than just yes. that. <laughs> We deserve for there to be a lot more than, than that. Grab your quarters. Yeah, yeah like it's, just, <laughs> it's not what video games are. And that just tends to be, you know, the conversation tends to be led by like, you know, media companies trying their best and that's just the aesthetic they know. Uh, or really video game collectors have tended to sort of lead the conversation on what it is we talk about when we talk about video game history. And that's just based on the stuff that's collectible, right? So like... You know, I would say 90% of video game history, probably more than that, of people talking about video game history are talking about, like, stuff that's on Nintendo consoles, right? They're not talking about, uh, you know, the, like, Apple II games or, like, mainframe stuff. You know, like, the stuff that people on YouTube have, like, bookshelves behind them full of, like, that tends to be what people talk about. And, I, again, it's because that's what people have, right? That's what people know to have. They know to have you know, complete inbox stadium events or whatever. So that's just kind of what they talk about. And we're just trying to change the way that people not only research games, but like think about games. Like we, we want that narrative to be rewritten a little bit and, and be a little more inclusive of, of uh, the, the enormity of what video game history has been. And if you have access to more of that stuff, then that becomes a lot easier. So mm -hmm. here's some of the stuff that we're doing. Um, I call it Stop the Bleeding and Fix the Future because we are losing stuff every single day. So, a, you know, kind of priority one right now is to make sure that we don't lose even more. So, yeah. you know, we're accepting donations both from individuals. Maybe they've worked in the industry. Maybe they just had a, you know, a friend or a parent or something that worked in the industry. Maybe it's from a, a closed down studio, a closed down media company. I and mean, we'll take things just kind of no questions asked. We've shown up places with a van before and yeah. uh, been able to rescue some stuff. And we're also, of course, building an archive for it all where researchers are going to be able to come and, and look at this stuff. Um, this is not a great picture of our shelves here, I'm realizing now that I'm looking at it, but um, this is a, a small section of what we have at the at the Of just the magazines that we have yes. right now in the office. Yeah, and, exactly. and it's maybe like a third of it, something like that. Um, but, you know, it, it is sort of illustrating that like, you know, there's there's some there's some order to this chaos, right? Um, this is also only a photo of magazines, right? So when we're talking about like cleaning out offices, no questions asked stuff, that tends to be the more behind the scenes materials from game developers, which for the most part is a little bit harder to photograph. I mean, I don't I don't have anything near me, but it tends to be like. Do you want to see what you can get off this hard drive? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like it tends to be stuff <laughs> Here's like that. Here's a stack of CDs. Like, <laughs> yeah. Here's a stack of poorly labeled CDRs. I think that game's on here somewhere that I worked on. Right. Yeah. Like it tends to be stuff like that. Or like we recently um, worked with the family of a deceased programmer and it was just, I mean, oh, actually, I do have his hard drives over here. And it's just, again, it's literally like we know he worked on some interesting stuff. If you guys can make sense of this box of unlabeled crap, then great. Um, yeah, so that tends to be, you know, the not as sexy stuff, but it is what we think is the future of video game research is being able to actually access uh, that level of material. Yeah. And, you know, outside of just saving what's dying right now, um, and of course things on like magnetic media and even CDRs, I mean, all of those things can rot and die and so we need to get those off of those materials before they are you going to show a, a dying i do have list? a rotting one right yeah, here i don't know if that's going to show up there we yeah. go like that's <laughs> that's gone now that yeah. data is just gone like you can 
you can see me through a hole in it right now. That data just doesn't <laughs> exist anymore. This this isn't like common, but CDs, especially CDR, like yeah. burnable media, is not permanent. And this is this is the inevitability of of like what's going to happen to the stuff if we don't digitize it. Exactly. So outside of that, we're also obviously advocating for a better future, trying to make it so that we don't have to always be running around uh, like a chicken with its head cut off, trying to save everything. We're trying to solve a lot of the preservation issues. Um, one of the things that we have been working on for a couple of years um, is a joint grant with the University of Washington, where we're equipping libraries with the tools to handle this stuff. Because right now, if you handed someone a stack of uh, or big box of stuff from a developer a lot of it would be very difficult to classify in a library system and difficult to run and be accessible by a researcher who wanted to see it i mean how do you yeah i mean i would imagine there's at least a couple people watching who have some sense of game development and, and have possibly worked in the industry like even if you just handed a librarian like a clean source code repository uh they're probably not going to know things like dependencies, right? Like tools needed to build this target platform, right? They might not know that, uh, oh, I'm going to need, you know, a debug Xbox One to deploy this build to in order to actually make it playable, stuff like that. So we're we're trying, we think, okay, our long-term vision, our, our, our ultimate goal is that game development material is donated to libraries and archives and we're just trying and which is still a weird idea it's still like a brand new idea in the world um and we're trying to make that inevitable future uh that transition to it a, a little easier because it's not it's not like the old days where you know you're you're archiving like an author's work and it's like here's all of the like letters that were mailed across the world, the correspondence between the author right. and you know, like, that's not the world we live in anymore. And we need to figure out what the uh, equivalent of that is. If we're ever going to be able to tell, you know, the actual stories of how these works that are really important to us were actually made. And part of sort of stoking everyone on that Stoke in the market, the market. Thank you. <laughs> on that is uh, publishing the results of video game source research and being like, yeah. look at what can come out of this. Look at what we can do. If we have, you know, what kind of research can be done? What kind of commercial products can be made if this yeah. stuff is saved and available? Um, and, you know, and we're also trying to make sure the commercial industry has a big voice in this too. We want them to join the discussion. We want them to find this just as important as we do. And for not just like the really nice, awesome, it would be great if historians could blah, 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 because they don't care. What they care about is, you know, these th to do these things costs time and resources. So there's also commercial applications for all of this, too. And I mean, there's a real example of where we've done this, which is that we um, we mentioned Disney's Aladdin on the Sega Genesis earlier. We published an article on the website that broke down how that game was made by studying its source code. And it was, you know, this really popular article went really, really viral. And as a direct result of having published that, Disney republished Aladdin uh, along with The Lion King um, last year for consoles. Uh, and they actually were, they, they actually used uh, not only source from our archives for reference, but uh, the the volunteer engineer who wrote our article ended up working on that game for them. Um, so... You know, it, it's even for the commercial industry, there's there's a benefit uh, to um, celebrating your your past by sort of lifting the lid on this stuff. To me, it's like it's no different than Blu-rays of movies having, you know, little behind the scenes featurettes, stuff like that. We just don't get a lot of that in games and, and we could and we should. And I think that video game consumers more than any other medium are hungry for that stuff. And, and I think we all benefit um, if it's preserved and, and the, these stories are told. So I have a few photos of just some of the things that we've done here in the top left corner here. Um, this was a project we did with uh, Game Informer the magazine. Uh, we were there for five weeks with a team of volunteers and we were saving everything that they had just sort of thrown in a closet for the last I can't do math, like 30 years almost. Um, yeah, 29. Game, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Game Informer has been around since 1991, 92, something yes, like that. 91. And they have basically, I mean, they're hoarders. It was just fantastic <laughs> news for us. Um, they just, I say that with a lot of love. <laughs> Order in the good way. Yeah, Order so like, way, they, yes. they, they these do. are 
disc ripping robots that we set up like a robot farm and we were um, digitizing all their old like press kits, things like, you know, um, companies would send early screenshots and trailers and, and fact sheets and things like that. And, and a lot of these will be like, you know, really early rough draft uh, visions of games that we now love. Uh, some of it'll be like games that never shipped at all. Some of that stuff, there's literally not even a Google result for yet. Like it fell between the cracks that badly. So this stuff is just priceless to historians. Yeah. And there's a lot more than just, you know, press kits on discs. They had paper stuff, they had slides yeah. and all of that stuff that we were able to help them digitize. Um, the one on the bottom left there is sort of the uh, showing up with a van thing that I mentioned <laughs> earlier. If, if your company's yeah, going this, under. <laughs> this was uh, this is a few years ago. This was um, a friend of mine who worked at IDOS uh, let me know that finally they were uh, moving offices from what used to be IDOS US before they transferred to the UK. And he was like, hey, uh, you got one day to come grab stuff. <laughs> So rented a van, showed up. Um, the uh, the top right actually is from uh, when we could still do uh, expos. Um, this was Portland Retro Gaming Expo last year, and we were able to uh, create a sort of pop-up museum exhibit uh, explaining the history of the Game Boy, because it was the, what, 30th anniversary? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so... Uh, you know, we were able to work with um, collectors, which which is actually another unique arm of what we're able to provide to the world is that we're really well entrenched, not only in the industry, like being, like working in the industry as we do, but uh, we, we've known these collectors. I've been going to classic game shows since the first one, since uh, Classic Gaming Expo 99. You know, we know collectively all the major collectors. So if we want to do this Game Boy exhibit, you know, we don't have to like go out and buy all this stuff almost everything you're seeing in this photo was borrowed uh from a collector and we were able to like bridge those gaps and bring all those collections together and, and and sort of tell the story of the game boy uh through this public display which was a lot of fun and a lot of work and a lot of work yes a lot of work <laughs> but, <laughs> for a two-day museum like we 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 built a real museum to only show for two days we took a lot of photos, at least. But, but we do this this sort of educational stuff as well. Um, we have some blog posts that go are, are really, really good, deep research. Um, most of it not, well, it, many of it, many of those things not even done by us, but done by others that we've hosted yeah. on here. Um, so those are definitely worth checking out, too. Um, but since we're running out of time here, I'll try to wrap up a little bit. Um, I did promise to tell you what else is going on out there and what you can do to help. And there's a lot. I mean, there's museums out there. There's the Strong. There's the National Video Game Museum. There's the Maid Museum in uh, Oakland. And that's just America. There's definitely some in the UK and all around the world. Um, there are universities. You know, in places where there's actual cultural funding. Yeah. Like, tends to be <laughs> right. Cultural institutions. Yeah. Um, there are university archives that are starting to have um, video game collections and even sometimes video game development collections occasionally. Um, so like Stanford and uh, University of Texas and Austin both have pretty robust archives of, of that sort of thing. Um, even places like the Smithsonian um, have done video game exhibits um, and have a little bit of game focus these days. The Library of Congress, they do what they can. They, they have a, a great team out there, but you know, there's it's government funded and you know, but the point is that like as of a few years ago they finally went oh right video games yeah, and, and exactly. like they they started actually archiving <laughs> games yeah um and then a lot of the grassroots stuff is where a lot of the you know really that's where the real work happens let's face it yeah exactly <laughs> that's where like the big hitting labor comes from um, all of the rom dumping groups that are you, you know places like and especially places like redump that are just yeah. getting every video game ever and validating the data and dumping it mo multiple times and being like, okay, that is that is the definitive version of that game. Um, yeah. And one of the many reasons we don't worry about the retail games too much. They're fine. They're fine. Um, <laughs> groups like Retromags and stuff that are, that are scanning things and putting them on the internet. Um, there are emulation authors that are doing great work so that someday when every NES is dead and completely unable to play. Impossible. <laughs> Those things are tanks. But yeah, I mean that, that's a part of that's a part of preservation we don't talk about very often is emulation authors and um, how they are 
continuing to reinvent the wheel and better understand how this hardware works so that we know when we're playing it that we're playing it correctly. Um, right. So. And then I hate this slide because I wish there was more. I wish I could say that there's a lot you could do to help, but it, to be honest, I mean, we're all kind of figuring this out together at the same time. Um, I, the first thing, the reason this is the first bullet point on this slide is because it's the most important is please just put anything you have on the internet archive. <laughs> it's not perfect, but they can host things. And, yeah. you know, then it's also incredibly, incredibly accessible. You know, anybody can go on to archive.org and look at it. So if you have anything, if you want to start scanning things, that's where you should put it first before you shop it around anywhere else. And also, I mean, um, what's not on here is, you know, maybe donating material if you have something interesting to someone like us or the strong. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Money, too. I mean, money helps. <laughs> yeah. Money's good. Like, money is what we definitely need the most of. But, um, you know, for example, um, I had someone reach out recently who was like, hey, back in the 90s, I used to fill out the survey card in the back of the issues and of every video game magazine. And, uh, video game companies used to mail me stuff. Do you want that? And I was like, yeah, great. And he mailed us a stack of just these incredible newsletters that like no one has yeah. just like weird photocopied, like Vic Tokai newsletters about how Golgo 13 is coming out soon, stuff like that. And it's like, you know, he didn't even realize that like, this is material that like, th I know the biggest newsletter collector. He's just insanely jealous that we got this because he's he had never even seen, like, five issues of, of the stuff that we got, and he's, like, the definitive guy. So, like, there's just things like that you might not think of. Like, my uncle owned a video store. If your uncle owned a video store in, like, the 80s and 90s, he, that, he probably got a lot of promotional material or, like, you know, sometimes... Actually, a coworker of mine at Digital Eclipse, I think it was actually his uncle uh, who was a buyer for like a video store chain or something. He actually had like prototype NES cartridges that were sent to him that were really interesting. And you don't, you don't think of that Avenue, but like, just think if you've had like relatives, family, friends, anything like that, that works, you know, in the industry or around it, who might have things that maybe aren't on eBay. Let's put it that way. And if so, maybe figure out uh, how to, how to get that stuff donated somewhere appropriate. And another thing, you know, we're talking a lot about older stuff, but uh, yeah. one of the things that I like to say, obviously conventions aren't happening right this second, but one of the things that I do at every convention I go to is I just go around and try to grab everything that's on a piece of paper that I possibly mm -hmm. can, and I put it in a big envelope and just label it like PAX 2019. And then that or like Jason the Scott also, you know, Jason Scott does something similar where he takes a photo of every booth. Yeah. You know, and like just puts that out there. And That's that is awesome. enormously important for historians. Yeah. I mean, to be because able to there's going to be a photo of like the next Miyamoto in one of these right. in his in his earliest days. Or, you know, like or you know, games that didn't ship, or yeah. um, you know, there's so much you can learn from trade shows and fan shows and that sort of thing. And you know, we don't have as many of those, I think, these days, or as many of the trade show focused ones, but. Um, we still have all these fan shows where people are getting to play games early and yeah yeah so photos and pieces of paper and stuff from all of that extremely helpful um we go to as many as we can but you know if you're going to them especially in other countries and stuff make that envelope and send it our way and that will become a permanent part of the archive so i always tell people you should just kind of join the community there's just a big community of people who care about this stuff we have a discord it's a uh, part of our, our patreon there's lots of forms there's lots of discord groups um like gaming uh, gaming alexandria might be a really good starting point if you're just interested in like how can i as an individual sort of contribute to the the digital bank of video game knowledge. I think Gaming Alexandria is a really good uh, community to join and just be like, hey, how can I help? These are my skills. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then, you know, contributing to Redump if you can, put your disc in a computer drive, follow the instructions, help validate. Yeah, if you're a collector, right? Yeah. Like you might have some rare-ish stuff that maybe hasn't been validated yet. You can go to redump.org and kind of see what they need. And it, it's literally like, you don't even have to upload a file to the internet, uh, really. It's just like, follow these instructions, did this text string match what you got? Great. Let us know. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, so I wish I could say there was a lot more you could do to help right now, but we're still kind of figuring that out ourselves. Yeah. But, uh, you know, feel free to talk to us. That's what all of these are for. Um, our Twitter is at GameHistoryOrg. You can email us, um, info at GameHistory.org. And if you are so inclined, you can also support us on Patreon, um, where you can get access to our Discord and all kinds of other fun things and be around other people that care about this stuff. Yeah. And that's a really good way. I mean, even though we're even though we're kind of asking you for money by saying that, but it is a really good way to join a community that's uh, um, really dedicated to this. Uh, everyone in our Discord is is sort of leaning on the the same way we are, right? The sort of hardcore historian type who just wants the world to be better. So if if that's if that sounds like your kind of crowd, you know, that's that's the that's the community that we've tried to foster with this uh, Discord. So uh, come hang out with us. Cool. Uh, that's all we have. And I appreciate you guys watching this. Are we doing Q&A? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, again, feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions or comments or anything. We're, we're mostly available. Cool. Thanks a lot, everybody. This is fun.